Hello everyone, welcome to today's show. We have a very special and a very popular figure in Salesforce ecosystem as our guest today. A true Salesforce evangelist, five time running Salesforce MVP and the co-founder of hugely popular Midwest Dreaming Conference, Eric Dreshfield. Hello Eric. Oh, hello there. Thanks for having me on the show today. It's I appreciate to it. Have you with us, Eric. So Eric, to start with the con uh, the chat, I think any conversation about Eric the Salesforce enthusiast has to begin with your incredible journey, right? Well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was going through your entire Salesforce history. So why don't you actually give us a small recap about your entire journey in the Salesforce ecosystem? Sure. So it was back in 2009 when I first got introduced to Salesforce. And it was one of those um, by accident kind of introductions. Um, I mean, you, you hear all the stories about everybody becoming an accidental admin where they're kind of handed the keys to Salesforce and, and told, go ahead and make things happen. Mine was a little bit different than that. Um, I was working for a tech company providing support to their customers as an, a call center agent and had a phone call uh, from the VP over the call center. And she was telling me about a new role that she was working on getting approval at, at for, and it was a business analyst role. And she, she said, um, I'd like you to take this new role uh, as a business analyst to help us roll out Salesforce uh, to the contact center that you're now working oh. in. And my answer or my reaction to her at that point in time was what Salesforce, I've never heard of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, she she was practically ready to give me the job to do this, and I had never even heard of Salesforce. Uh, and so that was needless to say um, that it spawned a lot of questions. Um, and she just kept telling me, "I you have the skills I'm looking for based on your history and the other jobs that you've worked in. He says, I, you'll get it. You'll understand it. You won't have any trouble figuring things <laughs> out. Uh, and so... I guess you could say the rest is history. Right, so we have an accidental Salesforce enthusiast amongst us at the moment, is it? Right. I mean, and the whole the whole enthusiast piece, she kind of started that, that manager of mine who gave me that first role really kind of started that too. Because one of the first things that she told me was, I really don't have budget to send you to okay. training. So you need to learn as much as you can on okay. your own. And keep in mind, this was this was 2009. It was way before okay. Trailhead existed. So knowledge knowledge on the Salesforce ecosystem and 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 platform was Google searches, uh, user groups if you could find a user group around you, um, and and Salesforce events like Dreamforce. Okay. And so I I started looking for a user group to attend, and there wasn't one anywhere close to me. Uh, the closest one would have been about a three hour drive each way. And so I, I just kind of kept looking around and trying to find when there were meetings around. And the first one that I found was in Chicago. And that's actually about a five and a half hour drive from my house. So I shot my boss an email and said, hey, I found a user group meeting. It's in Chicago. Um, the same day as that user group meeting, Salesforce is hosting um, an event that I think back then they referred to as a CloudForce tour, which today they would call a world tour. Um, they were smaller back then, obviously, because the whole ecosystem was way smaller. And her response to me to, to me telling her about that was, well, drive up the night before, spend the night in a hotel, and then go to both events and come on home. And she said, just keep keep searching for more more events like those that you can go to because those we can afford. Uh, they're, they're not nearly as expensive as sending you to training and, and keeping you from being productive. She said, so go ahead and do it. Um, so she kind of gave me this little gentle push down the user group path, and I spent about a day, a month, traveling to user group meetings uh, anywhere as far away as Chicago, wherever okay. I could find one, kind of, within a three to five or six hour drive. Um, and after a few months of that, I finally said, well, I can't really be the only person in southern Indiana using Salesforce, so I'm going to talk to somebody at Salesforce okay. and see if they they would be willing to start a user group in my area. Okay. And so that that was an interesting conversation as well because their basic response was, um, congratulations, you just started a user group. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so 
If, so the basic origin <laughs> of sales southern indiana's user group is they could you could not find a user community in your near vicinity so you just decided to start one on your own is that it essentially yeah i i, I didn't initially plan to start it i i was hoping someone else would but through the conversation i had with salesforce when i asked them about it and they basically said you just volunteered okay. to lead the group I said, well, I don't know a whole lot about Salesforce, but maybe leading a group of other people trying to learn about it would be a good way for me to learn about it. So I took the ball and ran with it and, and got connected to some people in the area that were using Salesforce. And about two months after that phone call with Salesforce, I held my first user group meeting and it was me and five other people. So there were six of us at this meeting for about three and a half hours talking about where we were in Salesforce, what we were doing, what our okay. companies were trying to do with it, um, what kind of things we need to learn, uh, and, and all that. And that meeting, I mean, that group has been meeting ever since. That was in 2010. So I've been running this group for eight years now, just about. I think it was actually May of 2010 when I held that first meeting. So we're coming up real close onto the the eight-year oh, anniversary. The animation setting. Um, so. Well, thanks. And so we, we've we seen anywhere from that six people all the way up to about 35 people attending the meetings. Um, and it depends. It seems like it depends a little bit on the location of the meeting and a lot on the content of what's being discussed in the meeting as to how many people show up. All right. So um, I think one of the main terms of Salesforce is that it is a wholly community-driven aspect, right? So being a very active member yourself, right. uh, can you please highlight me how exactly the community aspect sets Salesforce apart from the rest of the competitors? Well, you know, that's I, that's the big, that, that truly, in my opinion, that's the really big differentiator between Salesforce and other CRMs is the community aspect. Um, I mean, it's you, you go out to the community and there's two and a half, three million people out there active in the community there's four to five hundred user groups now around the world uh, there's there's a bunch of regional conferences uh, led by community members uh, that have all started popping up over the last few years but i think the strongest part about the whole salesforce community really is the people in that community um, if you're stuck on how to do something Sure, you can go through help and training and find some answers. You can can do some Google searches. Now you can go to Trailhead and probably get get some answers and, and kind of step through some of the issues. But if you're really stuck on something, post a question out on the community. Put it out on Twitter with the Ask Force hashtag. And within minutes, probably, you're going to have an answer from somebody who knows a little bit more about it than you do. Uh, it may be a Salesforce MVP. It may be another customer just like you. Uh, it may be a partner. Um, but, I mean, between the Ask Force hashtag on Twitter and the, the answers forum within the community, you can ask any question you want. Um, nobody's going to tell you, well, that's a really stupid question. Um, they're just going to answer your question. I mean, it's like free consulting, practically, to get an answer. Um, and, and I've done that plenty of times myself. When I get stuck on something, I say, I'll just go out there and say, hey, I know this is possible, but I don't know how to do it. Can you give me some ideas? Uh, and I usually get three or four responses with slightly different varieties of answers uh, on different ways to approach it. And that's that's kind of my my take on that. I usually test them all out and figure out which one I think works best for my right. situation. And that actually makes sense a lot because when we actually came into the entire Salesforce ecosystem, the one thing that enthused me the maximum about the whole Salesforce was the Salesforce community. And there were a lot of people who were actively contributing towards this ecosystem with answers coming in from everywhere, questions, a lot of, lot of questions flying in and everybody very eager to help each other out. And I think it actually flies with the entire concept of Ohana that uh, Mark Benioff has got for himself. So another important aspect of Eric Dreshfield is obviously the five time M MVP. So. I'm sure that most of our listeners would be interested in knowing more details about it um, since they might be having ambitions for themselves. Could you please give some advice to the young aspirants about this? So, you know, that that's a that's a question that I get a lot is, is what's it take to become an MVP? And my usual answer is there's, there's not really a secret sauce. There's no set pattern of events 
or or contributions that that make someone an MVP. It, it's really a combination of a lot of different things. It it's a combination of are you available to help people? Do you help people freely and willingly? Um, do you, I mean, I guess in some respects, do you go out of your way to help others learn more about the platform? Um, and and then um, I think the biggest part about it is the reason is about why you do that, um, why you're why you're out there helping others learn and and things like that. Um, I mean, for me, it, it's my way of giving back because I kind of feel like the community got me to where I am today uh, by my my transitions in my roles that are that are in the Salesforce ecosystem, uh, how I got some of the jobs that I've had, and and where how the community has kind of boosted me to where I am today. And I think a lot of the MVPs that are out there today kind of feel the same way, where where they got their starts by someone else in the community helping them. So they're doing the pay it forward thing and trying to help others. Exactly. So there is this whole mass encouragement moment going on, right? That's the whole beauty of Salesforce. So whenever a new release is occurring, there is any new announcement coming in, a lot of discussions happening in different forums and everyone actively participates in it. And at the same time, whoever has got even the minute doubt regarding any technical aspect or business aspect of Salesforce, there is a help readily available just at a Twitter hashtag or at a message in the partner community. It really sets Salesforce apart. So that was the beauty about it when right. we actually started started off with it. So there's coming back to Midwest Dreaming. I think uh, Midwest Dreaming is scheduled for this year. Could you please give us some insights on what you have got planned uh, for this year's edition of Midwest Dreaming? Sure. So this is the fifth year for Midwest Dreaming, or fifth year in a row um, in Chicago coming up this year. It is july the 11th through the 13th um and we have some really awesome keynote speakers okay. lined up uh, we have brett taylor who came over to salesforce mm -hmm. from quip uh, brett is now the chief product officer at salesforce uh, we also have dr natalie Petahoff, who is a program executive with salesforce um, she does a lot with um the service cloud, I believe. Um, she's a really interesting woman. I've had had the opportunity of talking to her a couple of times, uh, and she's got a really great story that she's going to share. And then our third keynote speaker is Phil Kamarni, and Phil is um, he, he works for Vala Offshore at Salesforce, and Phil is is um, I want to say his title is something along the lines oh. of Vice President of Innovation, and and Phil got his start on Salesforce at a university. So he's coming in from the higher ed side okay. where, where there's still a lot of opportunity and a lot of growth and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of cool things going on with the Salesforce platform. Okay. Um, now, for, for those people that are wondering about yeah. Peter Coffey, because Peter has been our keynote speaker for the last four okay. years at Midwest Dreaming, um, Peter's still coming back. He's, he's coming to support Midwest Dreaming again this year. And he's actually taking on the role of the master of ceremony this year. So Peter's going to kind of be the person who kicks off the event and introduces our keynote speakers. I, I guess we're kind of envisioning his role like he does at Dreamforce, where prior to the keynotes, he's up on the stage interviewing a few people and setting the stage and, and getting the crowd fired up. Um, so we're, we're thrilled to have Peter back again this year in a different role than he's been in the past. Uh, and I'm sure it'll be, be exciting no matter what he's talking about and who he <laughs> Who well, he brings on the stage with them. Eric. So one of the most beautiful things about Midwest Dreaming is, I guess that Midwest Dreaming was one of the earliest community-driven events by Salesforce in US. Am I correct? Yeah, that's true. Um, so Midwest Dreaming got its start actually in 2011. And um, prior to that, I believe there were two other community-led events that were in existence. Uh, the one called Snowforce that happens out in Salt Lake City got its start around that same point in time. But there was also an event that was held in Florida, uh, I believe like in 2008, 2009, maybe even in 2010, that was called Dreamforce to You Florida, uh, which was which was kind of the, the very first community-led event that I'm aware of. And while I was planning that very first Midwest Dreaming back in, in 2011, I spent a lot of time talking on the phone to the people who organized the Dreamforce to You Florida event to, to learn from their their challenges and the stuff they had to go through to pull off the event. 
Um, so it was really good to, to have somebody to, to kind of view as a mentor to get the ball rolling on Midwest Dreaming. All right. So who are the other team members who are actually involved in the entire organization of uh, Midwest Dreaming? Could you please give us a few introductions? Yeah, absolutely. So my 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 right hand person, um, my co chair, as I call her, and sometimes I refer to her as my Salesforce spouse, <laughs> is uh, Denise Carboni, and, and Denise runs the Chicago Salesforce user group. Denise is a Salesforce MVP, probably five, maybe six times now. Um, it's been oh. quite a while for her. And Denise is actually one of the first people that I met in the ecosystem. Uh, she was leading the Chicago user group when I attended my very first user group meeting back in 2009. Um, so she and I go way back okay. as far as Salesforce years go. Uh, Denise's husband, Jim Carboni, helps us out with the Midwest Dream and website and some of the technical stuff behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, then we also have um, Samantha Safin helping us. She kind of manages our nonprofit content and some of the interaction with nonprofit uh, customers and, and partners. Uh, we also have Nick Lindbergh helping us. Um, Nick manages our volunteer process, so the, the people that are running around helping us run the event on the actual days of the event, Nick does all the coordination mm -hmm. of that effort and training those people and making sure everybody knows where things are and, and how to answer the questions when somebody asks one, one on site. And then we also have Andy Ognanoff helping us, uh, and Andy really does a lot of the behind-the-scenes, more technical stuff as far as um, tying in our registration system to our Salesforce org, uh, getting our badging system lined up and making sure all of that's going to function properly. So on-site, when somebody comes in uh, to pick up their, their badge at registration, if for some reason it wasn't already printed, Andy can take care of getting a new badge created and things like that. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty diverse team. We're all either Salesforce MVPs or user group leaders, or some of us are, are both. All the very best on that, Eric. Let's we eagerly look forward to the Midwest Dream 2018 edition. Yeah, oh yeah, it, it's gonna be exciting. Uh, we just, a couple days ago, um, finished the process of picking our sessions and, and announcing, well, we, we didn't announce the sessions publicly, we notified all the speakers. Uh, who submitted sessions uh, that they were either accepted or not. And this was a, a record-setting year for the session process for Midwest Dreamin. Uh, we got 200 applications for sessions, and we only have 35 spaces uh, oh. al allocated for sessions. Great news. So it took a lot. Yeah, it took a lot for someone to get their session approved. Okay. And and it's it's been interesting, the process that we've been using over the last four years now to select those sessions. It's, it's a blind process. So the, the people on the content committee who vote on the sessions, they simply get the title of the session and the description. They don't know who's presenting it, who what their qualifications are or any of that. So they simply base the, the merits of the session on the description itself. And everybody who's on that committee votes, gives it a ranking from zero to five, and those with the highest scores win. And the ones with the highest scores are the ones that get accepted for Midwest Dreaming and move on and, and become okay. sessions. And I think this is going to be the first edition where we can expect the participants to cross 1,000. We'll see about that. Um, but we've hit we've hit 800 a couple of years ago. Uh, two years ago, it was, was right at about 800. Last year was down a little bit, but we figured it probably dropped some because it was later in the year. So two years ago, it was in July. Last year, it was in August. And a lot of the people possibly couldn't attend because their kids were going back to school. So we're back in July this year. So I, I think the numbers will probably trend back up okay. again versus last year. But we'll just see what happens. Um, a thousand would be kind of neat, <laughs> but I think it would also be kind of scary. <laughs> Fingers crossed, Eric. It's a big effort to pull that thing off. Um, those of us on the committee to, to help organize this event. Um, most of us do something related to the event just about year-round now, um, so it's not just a few months out of the year that we spend taking time to, to do but things with this event. But it's a huge event. event. If a community-led event crosses the 1,000 participation mark, it's something that you can really be proud of. Yeah, oh, definitely. That that would be a, a, a record for, for the U.S. at least. I know India Dreamin' last year had, I think, yeah, 1,400 yeah. or maybe 1,500 people. But there hasn't been one that large right. here in the U.S. Let's, let's eagerly looking forward to it. So I think your entire role in organizing 
Midway Streaming had played a crucial part in you currently coordinating the events for Aptest Accelerate, correct? Well, I, I, it's it's probably impacted it some. Yeah, I mean that that's part of my role at Aptest is helping them with Accelerate. Uh, I'm managing one of the session tracks okay. there this year, um, which I've done the past couple of years as well for for Aptest. Um, but you know, my my primary role at Aptest is actually managing their blog site. So I, I either write a lot of the content that goes on the blog or I herd the cats, as I like to say, uh, to try to get content from other people, uh, product managers, product marketing team, uh, some of the senior executives. Uh, they all contribute to the blog sites every once in a while. And my, my primary function with the company is to make sure that there's blog content going out on a regular basis and that it's high quality content. And then, of course, promoting it through social media and other channels to make sure people read it uh, so and so find some value in it. We actually find a very quality blog on Aptus website. We can be proud that okay, Eric is the one who is actually behind this. Right. Correct. So I think yeah. uh, this year's edition of Aptus is held in May 14 to 16, correct? And it's at Palace of Fine Arts, San Francisco. Right. That is correct. That's a new venue for us this year, so I'm looking forward to being there. I've never seen that building before other than in pictures, okay, so and it has got it'll be interesting. A stellar guest list as well, I guess. Sir Richard Branson is attending it. Right. We just announced Richard Branson very recently, about a week or two ago, yes. that he's our, our special guest. That's correct. He, he will certainly uh, bring uh, a new level of excitement correct. to the meeting. And obviously, Kirk will definitely be speaking as well, correct? So, now I'd like to have your opinion on a couple of... Um, state of industry questions here this is more on the perspective that you had made a few predictions way back in 2017 so you had predicted that 2018 is going to be an year of acquisitions for salesforce similar to 2016 when they had acquired steelbrook prediction io quip demandware etc and along those lines salesforce right. acquired mulesoft for around six billion past month so what is your right. take on it? So I know that it's a very huge milestone in the entire career of in the entire history of Salesforce. So how exactly do you think that Salesforce is going to evolve, evolve in the next few years or uh, what exactly can we expect in the next few months to come? So yeah, so so the MuleSoft acquisition was the largest dollar value acquisition that Salesforce has ever made up to this point. Um, I think it was about double the size um, of, of the exact target acquisition from a few years ago, which that that transitioned into becoming the marketing cloud. Uh, and, you know, we've already heard them talk about MuleSoft as the integration yeah. cloud. Um, and and I, think, I think that was a smart move on their part. I mean, there, there are certainly a few partners out there that do integration uh, between uh, Salesforce and other cloud uh, solutions and, and on-premise solutions. Mm. But I think um, with them bringing MuleSoft in-house and, and all the the connections that MuleSoft has available, um, I think is really going to strengthen the whole platform overall. Correct. It's It totally fits into the complete picture strategy that Salesforce is having, right? Have, from having end-to-end -end process being offered to these customers to having connect, to connecting all the different systems that they have got together, everything actually comes falling into place one by one. Right, that's true. I mean, it... it even going back a couple of years when they first started talking about having a 360 degree view of your customers. Uh, I mean, integration it plays a big role in that because it helps helps complete that so circle. Do you actually foresee this trend of acquisition continue being continued in the next for the next couple of years? You know, that's a tough question. Um, I, earlier, I mean, you, you, you mentioned I predicted that I thought this was going to be a big year for acquisitions and it certainly is already even just with that okay. one. Um, I, I still think there's probably a few smaller companies that Salesforce is going to look at this year that they'll probably end up purchasing um, and bringing into the mix. Um, it, I can't necessarily point my finger as to why I'm feeling that way, but it, I, I think there's some some things that they're going to find. Somebody's going to approach Salesforce with a, a, a new cool idea or a new app, um, and Salesforce is going to look at that and say, well, we just need to have that. They said, it's, it's great, we need to have it, we want to make it our own. Um, and so I, I think this year is still going to continue to be a, a pretty big trend from an acquisition perspective. Um, going further out, who knows? I mean, it's 
it, it's hard to say what's going to happen later this year or next year. I guess once Dreamforce rolls around and we hear what Salesforce has on the roadmap, um, that may change things a little or it may speed things up. Who knows? Uh, but it'll be interesting for sure, no matter what happens. That's interesting. So um, just considering that from the customer standpoint, the Salesforce has introduced uh, the My Series, that is a My Trail Health and similar initiatives. This was something that you eagerly look forward to previously, right? right? What are your take on that? And what exactly can we actually look forward to from a business user yeah. perspective? Um, in 2018. Yeah, so so the My Trailhead piece is is really pretty interesting. I mean, they, they took a concept that they got uh, had going this trailhead concept of training, um, and and making it um, small bites of information that people can digest quickly, uh, and putting some gamification into it to to incite people to want to do it, and now they're making it available to to anyone to customize it for their own particular company use. Um, I mean, if you think about it, that's the whole evolution that the entire CRM uh, ecosystem and their whole platform has gone through. They started with a core set of features, and they've kept adding more and more to it based upon what the customers want. And so I, I think from that regard, my trailhead and even all the Einstein analytics uh, where they were talking about it last year at Dreamforce where it's Einstein for everyone and analytics for everyone, I think that's kind of a continuation of that whole thing. Um, I think that's going to keep going. There, there's still a lot of legs underneath that, and it, it should keep growing uh, for a while now, I think. Mm, yes, correct. So the personalization is the underlying theme here, right? With my trailhead, Einstein, and all coming into the picture, everything is getting even more personalized. For whatever application that we're using Salesforce, uh, the overall aim of Salesforce as a company is to provide Salesforce is a personalized experience. Don't you feel so? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think they're really they're doing a pretty good job of that right now. But like you said, adding Einstein analytics and the the artificial intelligence piece to that, along with Trailhead, I, th I think um, I think that's really going to expand that more and and bring a lot more uh, customers onto the platform, uh, expand the community a lot more with with those additional people right. as well. So that is the business aspect of things. So just coming back to your personal experience. I mean, just know what was your favorite Salesforce moment in your entire experience that you had over the past five, six years? It may be something that you had uh, in your Dreamforce experience. I actually forgot to ask you about that as well. How was your experience in Dreamforce? Oh, you know, Dreamforce, I've been attending Dreamforce now every year since um, 2011, if my memory is correct. Um, and, you know, every year there's something new and something different and, and something exciting going on. And every year I tell myself I'm going to attend all these sessions. I'm going to make it to all these things. <laughs> and every year I end up not getting to, to half of the things that I wanted to do. Um, but the reason I don't do that isn't necessarily because I booked myself for too much. It's that I find people that I wanted to meet, uh, get involved in conversations, and we just keep talking. And then suddenly we realize, oh, the session's already started. It's half a mile away on the other side of the Dreamforce campus. I'll just catch the recording later because I know they're recording it. Um, so, I mean, for, for me, the last two or three years at Dreamforce has probably really been more all about the community and about the people and meeting people that either I've known only through Twitter or through the Salesforce community um, or even just people that I had never met before until that particular moment. Um, just just helping to to learn everybody else's story and how they got to where they are just in my mind helps kind of grow the whole community and, and makes everybody realize what really is out there. It's, it's a, one of those things where, you know, you, you don't necessarily know what questions to ask until you start asking questions and hearing other people ask nice. them. So it's it's I think the people it, it is the biggest aspect of I that think, whole uh, event for me. I just it in that um correct description of say a Dreamforce. Whenever people actually want to attend most of the sessions in Dreamforce, the main reason why they couldn't attend any of those events or sessions, the major reason that they give is that they met someone more interesting and they just had a conversation and it just kept flowing. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's that's the whole power of the community, I think, really, is is getting all those connections made because you never know what it's going to lead to. 
Uh, it may lead to uh, a new contract if you're like working for a consultant. It may lead to a new job if you're an independent or or even if you don't realize you're out there looking for a job, uh, you may meet somebody who you have a great conversation with and the next thing you know, they're coming back to you and saying, hey, I've got this position I'd like to talk to you about. Um, so yeah, it's 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 okay. really pretty it's, fascinating. Uh, I think that's a beauty of collective collaboration that I would say, but that's the whole thing that Salesforce stands for as well, I guess. So uh, before we leave, uh, do you have any message for our listeners, um, Eric? Um, I guess if I was going to leave any any parting words of wisdom, um, I would probably have to say, don't be afraid to talk to people. Uh, if you're at Dreamforce, for example, even though there's huge crowds, if you're standing in the line waiting to get into a session, or if you just sat down in a session, talk to the people sitting next to you and introduce yourself, uh, find out a little bit more about them just to, to understand who they are and what their struggles are and maybe there's something you can help them with. I, I do recall one one story from Dreamforce, uh, I don't remember which year now that I'm going down this path, but I, I was flying out to San Francisco to go to Dreamforce and I was changing planes in Atlanta and I posted a message out on the, the Dreamforce app, I think they called it back then. Uh, today it would be the Salesforce or Trailblazer community. Okay. I just simply posted a message out there that said, I'm in the Atlanta airport on my way out to Dreamforce, sitting at gate C37 or whatever it was, waiting to board my flight. If anybody wants to talk about Salesforce, oh come God. find me. Um, and about and about five minutes <laughs> later, I had two people walk up to me and say, hey, are you Eric? And it's like, yes, I sure am. Uh, so we had a great conversation waiting on our flight, um, and it really surprised me how often I ran into those two people during the whole the whole Dreamforce week. Out of the thousands of people that were there, I, I still managed to run into those two at least three three times during the whole week, just by chance. Um, but it was great to to have that connection and and recognize a face and a name in the crowd, um, and it really kind of brought the event to a new level. So. Don't be scared to talk to people, uh, even if it's nothing more than a hi, my name's Eric, um, where are you from kind of thing, and and just see where it goes. All right, Eric. <laughs> Thanks for that interesting insight. I'm pretty sure that most of our listeners will try doing it at this edition of Salesforce, Dream, uh, Dreamforce, as well as uh, other major community-led events. So I think that's all, right. all for the day, Eric. Thanks a lot for sparing your time and sharing your insights with us. I. No problem. Well, thanks we for having look me. Look forward to this year's Midwest Dreaming and Aptus Accelerate. Thank you, Eric.